um, said that we had moved so far from the country's original ideals that we needed a revolution in values. Heard folks earlier in the panel talk about values and the importance of values. Couldn't second that more or reaffirm that more uh, positively. But a revolution isn't tinkering. A revolution isn't modifying. A revolution is fundamental change. It's change that starts, as I've already mentioned, with getting a new perspective on old problems. The old problems aren't going to go away. The old problems, as Wilma mentioned, I think, in her opening remarks uh, 100 years ago, we're talking about the labor problem. Uh, pretty much those labor problems, safety and health, discrimination, wages, decent working conditions or whatever, they're the same. <laughs> the, 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 with the same, little different context, but essentially the same uh, problems. You need a new way to think about those old problems, a new way to address them, a new way to perceive them. Human rights is an ancient concept, but the concept of workers' rights as human rights particularly in the United States, is a new endeavor. Um, maybe even only in the last 15 years has serious attention been paid by human rights groups as well as other groups to the question of worker rights as human rights. And what does it mean to say that a worker's right is a human right? In other words, does, do workers have the right to a safe and healthful workplace simply because we have an Occupational Safety and Health Act? Do workers have a right to exercise their freedom of association only because we have a National Labor Relations Act? Do workers have a right not to be discriminated against only because we have an Equal Employment Opportunity Act? Hmm. Human rights says, even if you didn't have those things, there'd be something wrong about being discriminated against being used as a resource, being working in a place where you have to give up an arm, an eye, a leg, or your life for a job, or that you're discriminated against because you're of your age or your race or your gender or whatever. Something fundamentally wrong about that. And it's fundamentally wrong because these rights, these worker rights, human rights, do not, um, although in, in practice they are, are not in fact checked at the workplace. Uh, they go with the human being in the workplace, or they should. So you have those rights by virtue of the fact of being a human being, not by virtue of the fact of qualifying for unemployment insurance, or qualifying or being covered by the National Labor Relations Act. You have, <laughs> you have those rights by virtue of being a human being. That concept, challenges every orthodoxy, every tradition, every practice. It should challenge all of those of our traditional labor management relationships. It challenges everything. It challenges every aspect of it. That's why it's so potent. It is a seriously potent new approach to the concept of the proper relationship between worker and employer. It shifts the folk, well, let me, I don't, I don't want the lot of coffee. That one of the concerns I have, uh, and people have <laughs> referred to me as the person who hatched this conference, uh, it's sort of like an unnatural act or something, but uh, that, <laughs> that, a concern about this is we talk about this stuff. We need to talk about this stuff. But maybe because it comes from academe, there's a tendency <laughs> when you do that to move away from reality into abstraction and generalization and uh, statistics. Workers become statistics. Uh, and you move away from the real world consequences of human rights violations 
including human rights violations at the workplace, which occur all the time in the, in the United States. When we talk about people being fired for engaging in freedom of association, that's a violation of their human right. It's not just a violation of the statute. That's what I mean by a new perspective. It elevates this idea to say, whoa, this is even more than a violation of the statute. It's a violation of a human being's right to engage with other people for their own mutual aid and protection, as the law says. Now, that danger that I've talked about, that abstraction, as you move away from people in the streets, you lose contact with them, they become abstractions, that's a major league danger. It's kind of fiddling, I call it academic fiddling while the world burns. <laughs> sit in classrooms and talk about this stuff uh, and theorize about it and go out and read about it while people are dying, <laughs> uh, literally. huh? The level of safety and health issues in this country is gigantically serious. Uh, but fortunately, uh, today we have no fiddlers on this panel. Uh, uh, we have people who have dedicated their lives uh, to the promotion and protection of worker rights, and particularly from a human rights perspective. Uh, in the, I think, immortal words of Mother Jones, uh, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. Uh, and that's what these folks do and have done. Um, to my left, Mary Joyce Carlson, uh, labor and employment lawyer from Washington, D.C. Uh, she currently serves as a national counsel to the Fast Food Workers Organizing Committee. Uh, just returned to be with us today from uh, Madrid, um, uh, where she, her work continues on an international basis. Um, during the Clinton administration, Ms. Carlson served as deputy general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, she served on the negotiating team for the 1.3 million Service Employees International Union members in reaching labor accords and collective bargaining agreements with two of the largest healthcare corporations in the United States. She's also consulted with the U.S. State Department and labor ministries in Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East on issues of labor law and industrial relations. Uh, to Mary Joyce's left, Arvid Gannison is the Director of business and, uh, <clears throat> the Business and Human Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, he has uh, led the organization's work to expose human rights abuses linked to business and other economic activity at the international, involving international financial institutions, supply chain monitoring, monitoring, and his work has taken them all around the world, including countries such as Angola, Azerbaijan, Burma, China, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Equatorial Guinea, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and the United States. Uh, his recent research is focused on predatory lending practices and government issues on Native American reservations in the United States. Uh, last and definitely not least, uh, Hetty Rosenstein is a third, <laughs> third generation union activist. She graduated from Livingston College with a degree in history and urban teaching, teacher education. Found herself working for the state of New Jersey at the Job Corps in Edison. Uh, where conditions were so poor uh, that she decided that uh, should be an organizing drive going on. Uh, and that while she was conducting that organizing drive, she um, discovered the Communication Workers of America, um, began participation in a statewide organizing drive with them for all clerical, professional, and supervisory state workers became a union shop steward, ran for office, and eventually became president of CWA Local 1037 in the spring of 22. 
in the little bio sketch that she sent me, uh, Ms. Rosenstein ends up saying, uh, CWA is organizing to build a movement for democracy and economic and social justice in New Jersey and across the country. Workers' rights are human rights. And so um, I will turn this over to our distinguished panel and then we'll have questions uh, at the end of their presentations.